Welcome back everybody. So we are starting a series of four lectures on slug tests uh, today. So in this first lecture, I will introduce what slug tests are um, briefly and go through some analogy, a little bit of theory, but not really in a lot of details, more of a conceptual derivation to kind of show you how these things work. Uh, and then in the next three lectures, we will see like specific methods. So essentially graphical methods again uh, of, you know, deriving aquifer property using slug tests. Okay, so what slug tests are, essentially you have that picture on the left hand side here. Uh, you can see what a slug is. Uh, so it's really like a poor man's uh, aquifer test, if you will. So obviously pumping well tests are very expensive. I mean, you can do them, but you know, you have to drill a well, then you need an observation well, typically somewhere away from that uh, pumping well. So, you know, the whole thing is a lot of investment and you wouldn't do that just to get, you know, something, you know, aquifer transmissivity, unless it was for a big investment or, you know, engineering projects, large engineering projects. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, what you have as a well is what you see here, which is, you know, pretty much a four inch PVC pipe or a two inch PVC pipe or an auger sort of a hole, you know, into the ground uh, and some sort of a piezometer where you're monitoring, you know, the water level, so the head in that piezometer, uh, maybe the groundwater quality at some point, you take some samples here. So these are obviously very inexpensive. You just, you know, drill a hole in the ground, basically drive a PVC pipe in, and that's your piezometer for observations. So if you have one of those holes, uh, well, it's very convenient and cheap to basically do a slug test, which is instead of pumping that, uh, that well, now you're just dropping a slug, literally. So this is a slug here, uh, and you're dropping that you know, you're displacing a volume of water, basically. So when you're dropping that slug, that equivalent volume of water is displaced up, and then you can observe the level of water, you know, going back down over time. And now again, you're in that transient um, uh, realm where we've been, uh, that we've been talking about in those past few lectures, right? So now you're looking at that water level, you know, dropping back down over time, and then, you know, hopefully you're able to calculate some of those aquifer properties you know from that data uh, and here on the in the middle here is an example of that where you have head over time right in a in a borehole or in a hole uh, and then finally getting aquifer properties uh, again you know reiterating pumping tests are very expensive typically uh, labor cost equipment etc so slug tests are sort of a poor man's you know aquifer test um, or counterpart bail down test. So the bail down test is sort of the equivalent to a slug test, but instead of raising the water level up, you know, by dropping a slug, basically you're bailing down, meaning you're removing a volume of water from the hole. So that can be done with, you know, basically some sort of a, a, a scoop, pretty much that you, you know, remove a known volume of water or, you know, a, a pump where you pump down, you know, some amount of water and then you just let it go back up. Uh, so cheap and quick uh, alternative. So again, known quantity of water added or removed, uh, and then you observe. Uh, okay, so two types of responses. So this is sort of important, because, especially because we're not going to talk about that second response. So here we'll study overdamped uh, responses. So things that are, you know, somewhat linear with time, or you know, be not, not necessarily linear, but at least behave. You know, according to some predictable answer, so it's typically a log of time or something. But you know, the basically, if you raise the the level of water, it's going to go down. You know, over time, as opposed to in the underdamp uh, response, sometimes you have those oscillation around that uh, initial level. So this would be your uh, H zero. You know, the the stable level in the well, and then when you bail it or when you you know put a slug in then it kind of oscillates around that level. Uh, those types of responses you can also analyze, but now you need obviously some you know, oscillator or some sine functions or cosine functions. So we'll skip this for this class just because it's uh, in the interest of time. But you know, in the book in Federer, you can find uh, some of these analysis and you know, this is definitely possible. So if you have that type of data, 
you know, you can definitely also analyze that. But for this class, we'll only analyze the overdamped you know, responses. Uh, briefly, again, I mean, this is a reiteration, and we've seen similar things before. Uh, but one of the upsides of slug tests is that typically you can do them in wells that are not fully penetrating, so partially penetrating wells. Um, and here are two examples. So if you have a coarse, excuse me, <laughs> if you have a coarse um, matrix, so let's say sand or even courses and sand, then you know your well screen can be directly in that um, matrix. Now, if you have clay or a fine uh, sediment as your matrix, typically you'll have a core of a coarser uh, material, like a, a, a gravel pack, typically to protect that screen, and so it doesn't clog, you know, fast with all the that, that, those fines rushing into your well. So it's sort of a protection of the well. Now, obviously, the problem with that is that. Uh, those materials, you know, that gravel pack will have a different hydraulic conductivity from the surrounding aquifer, right? So when you do a bail down test or a slug test, you know, the initial numbers, if you will, <clears throat> may correspond to that gravel pack rather than the hydraulic conductivity uh, of the material you're trying to assess. So you have to be a little careful and oftentimes you'll have responses that exhibit like different periods so early on they'll have a slope and then later on you know a different slope and typically that that second slope is the one that is representative of the you know area around the well as opposed to just that gravel pack right around it uh, the other thing to pay attention to is that the casing and the well itself may have different diameters and in a lot of those equations that we we'll use for slug tests uh, you will need to know what the radius of the casing versus radius of the uh, screen is typically, I mean, they may be the same, but they may be different. Uh, and again here, so this is another example, right, where the screen here has a different um, radius from the casing uh, above. Um, and again, this is the, this is the behavior of the water level of the head. I should say if it's a confined aquifer like here, so the piezometric head right, is raised and then will go down as opposed to the pumped wells that we've seen so far. Okay, so one thing that I wanted to mention uh, before doing a little bit of theory is the falling head permeameter. So if you remember those Darcy lectures that we did a while back now, uh, we saw an example of a falling head permeameter and I showed that the Hydraulic conductivity was basically given by this equation here, where the A's here are the area of, you know, the small tube on top and the column of sand itself. Uh, and then, you know, the length of the sand, time, of course, uh, is in here. And then the initial head, you know, the ratio of initial head, the log of the ratio of initial head to uh, some later head. So this is, again, something we've done before, and you can see how this falling head permeameter is very similar conceptually, right? Similar to a piezometer where you would put a slug in, you know, raise that water level and watch it drop. So it's basically the same thing, like a piezometer to measure hydraulic conductivity, you know, using Darcy's law, that falling head permeameter versus a piezometer where you drop a slug and, look, and watch the head drop is essentially the same thing. Um, so again, quickly, um, a little bit of theory, right? So if we just read a mass balance here, Q out plus del V over del time. So, so again, this is just a statement of mass balance around that piezometer volume, if you will, right? So Q in, Q out, and then some change of volume over time, okay? So mass balance. In this case, we're not adding any water in, um, in the hole, right? So we're just observing that change of volume. So this is our statement of mass balance. Now we know that the volume is two pi r, excuse me, pi r squared b, of course, oops. Uh, Okay, so volume is pi r squared b. So again, this would be 
pi r squared, r being the radius of the casing or of that cylinder here, and then b would be the height of water, so that, that's the volume basically. Now q out, we can use our theme equation that we, or theme equation that we've uh, seen before, and that says that transmissivity equals q over 2 pi, well, h0 minus h1, uh, log ln r2 over r1. So again, if you remember your theme equation, right, this is what it says, so we have q in here, so we can just put q on the left-hand side and t on the right-hand side, and the advantage here is that now we have q as a function of head, uh, which means that now we'll have a differential equation that we can solve, right? So if we put all this together, we end up with something that looks like uh, 2 pi t, right? I'm putting this on the left-hand side here, 2 pi. Now, h0 minus h1, I can just um, do a normalization, or h0 is basically 0 because that's your stable level, so it doesn't really matter. And now we have h here, so it's like just h, let's call that h. Um, so 2 pi t, let's call it h, divided by ln r2 over r1 equals, so now we have this to account for, so dv again is going to be, I'm going to write, write this in differential form, pi r squared h, let's call it h as opposed to b, divided by dt. Okay, so now we have that differential equation where we recognize h on the left-hand side here and dh on the right-hand side here, so we can separate the variables, put them all together, and we end up with something that looks like some constants, constants, some constant times uh, dt equals 1 over h dh, right? So all those constants are basically I'm moving pi r squared on the other side, and all of these are constants or, you know, numbers, so we know all of that. So it's basically a bunch of constants times dt on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side I have 1 over h dh because I'm moving h on the other side. And this is really what it boils down to. So we can solve this. Obviously, we end up with 1 over h is going to give us some log of head on the right-hand side and time on the left-hand side. And now again, if we plot head versus time, now we end up with, you know, all those other constants are known. So the radius is supposed to be known. Uh, that, and that will allow us to calculate the transmissivity, which might be the only unknown, basically, in those equations. So that's really how, you know, again, conceptually, we can go from a mass balance to getting data of head versus time to calculating transmissivity for that aquifer. All right, thank you. In the next video, I will uh, show you how to use the first method, which is the Cooper-Jacob, uh, excuse me, the Cooper uh, method. Thank you.